All right, welcome to our Bridges of Belonging segment. We're focusing this uh, month on two incredible humans, Carrie Newman and Kirsty Hudson, and we're going to talk about their two beautiful books that they've produced together. And um, it's going to share a little bit of a journey of their belonging journeys, but also around building this book and this message and sharing about um, truths in Canada around Indigenous stories and reconciliation as we go forward. So Carrie, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about you. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, yo, Nguang, Carrie Newman, Heyman Bakum Klai, High Elf King Yume. I come from the Kukwakum, Kixam, and Wawalabai clans of the Kukwakiwak Nation, which is northern end of Vancouver Island, as well as from the Stalo Nation, which is Coast Salish territory along the upper Fraser Valley. Uh, that's through my father. Through my mom, I'm English, Irish, Scottish, settler stock from Saskatchewan. Um, I'm an artist, and I'm also a, a professor of visual arts and art history at the University of Victoria. And maybe relevant to this conversation, I was homeschooled, um, but I'll save that for when I talk a little bit more about flying. Amazing, thank you. And Kirsty, over to you to tell us a little bit about you. Um, I'm Kirsty Hudson. I'm a writer and editor based here in Victoria. Um, and I have a background in journalism. I spent almost 20 years with the CBC before moving over to the publishing world um, and meeting up with Carrie to write these two books together. I'm, um, I'm a mom um, of two wonderful children. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to be speaking to you today today from uh, Lekwungen territory here in Victoria. Beautiful. Thank you for kicking us off with those lovely and uh, brief introductions, knowing both uh, how accomplished both of you are and uh, the many different things that you do in this world to make the world a better and more inclusive place. Carrie, I want to go to you to share a little bit about what belonging means to you. Um, I was thinking about this because I think belonging happens in a lot of different ways. Um, I mentioned that I was homeschooled. So growing up, there were times that I felt like I belonged and times that I felt like I didn't because I was one of the kids in the neighborhood who was doing something quite different as far as um, my education and my daily life went. So there were times when because I was a homeschooler, I felt like I didn't belong. And then there was other times when I really felt like I belonged. Um, like when you come when you think about that from a family perspective, like who wouldn't feel like they belong in a family who take the time to to keep you at home all the time, right? Like uh, when you think about it from family perspective, very, very, very strong sense of belonging. Um, when you think about it from relating to other children, um, much less so. And and I think the reason I wanted to mention that is because it's sort of similar to having multiple um, ancestry, right? Being um, indigenous and being from um, from a settler family. Um, I have both of those experiences in this country. And so depending on which side of the spectrum I, uh, I'm sitting in or examining things from, you can really feel like as an indigenous person, you're excluded from so many things. Um, but because I have lighter skin, because I'm quote passing, um, I can fit into some of those situations. But that's like an aesthetic sense of belonging. Um, so what that what that uncovers is a lot of times people will feel comfortable saying things around me that they might not feel comfortable saying around somebody who has darker skin, who presents more. Um, uh, more the I guess what society expects an indigenous person to look like um, and so there have been some times when in the act of trying to you know like hey want to talk about those indigenous people and like insert stereotypes <laughs> and racism here um, I've had to figure out how to handle that moment right like um, one time I was at an art show and it was, uh, I was showing my first nation's artwork 
And this older white gentleman came up and was talked to me about my work and talked to me about his own practice of carving. He liked to carve things. And then he kind of leaned in and sort of said, hey, did, did they ever give you any trouble? And I first didn't know he meant, but, and I was like, excuse me, like, he's like, the, the, the Indians, do they ever give you any trouble for making their work? And I was like, that, this is my father right here. <laughs> and he was like, oh, oh, right. But like that, that's the kind of, um, the kind of example of a situation where somebody might not think they're speaking to an indigenous person and the kinds of things that come out. And that's a really tame version of it. So I guess um, that's a really long way of saying I have a complicated relationship with belonging because for different reasons, I can fit into different situations. And for those exact same reasons, I might feel excluded from them. Yeah, what a what a beautiful way to navigate that very complicated experience for yourself, Carrie, and to um, explore and unpack sort of when that shows up for you and what ways it shows up for you. And one that I'm sure you probably reflect on often in terms of like, how do you present in some of those situations? How do you show up and be authentic when you're navigating different identities and different ways of being with different people and not knowing what, how they're going to show up for you? Yeah, Kirsty, how about over to you um, for your experience and what belonging means to you? Um, this is a tough one um, for me when I think about what belonging means. And it may be that I've been um, at many track meets and sporting events um, this week with my kids. Um, but yeah, I, for me, it, it made me think back to, you know, my experiences with sports as a child. Um, and when I thought about the first time that I actually truly felt a sense of belonging, it's that sense of being on a team um, and being with a group group of people and, you know, being vulnerable as you are working your hardest and, um, you know, putting yourself out there. And I think that's, you know, when I saw today watching these kids running at this track meet, I mean, it was all kinds of kids, all kinds of abilities, but everybody, you know, not being afraid to put it out there and this sense of support, um, around, you know, around those kids as they did that, it made me think back to my own experience as a kid and realizing that that's, you know, really one of the first times that you get to have that feeling. Um, and maybe it doesn't last, you know, all the way through your schooling, but in those early days, that's, I think for me, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a really interesting question to think about, but um, I've been thinking a lot about that today and that sense of community and feeling of belonging. So I think that's what it means to me. Hmm. That's beautiful. And I love how you connected it to sort of a place and a space where you really felt belonging and that reflection on what that journey has been for you. And then really seeing that come to life this week for your kids as well. Um, I'm going to stay on you, Kirsty, and thinking about like, is there another example you want to share about a time you belonged or a time maybe when you didn't feel like you belonged? That's interesting. I mean, Carrie and I have been, if it's okay that I'm going to talk about the book for a second, because it's actually the best example I can think of. Um, because Carrie and I have been working together on these books and working together for years now, coming up on five years, something like that. Um, and I first met Carrie when I was a journalist at CBC, and that's how I was first introduced to The Witness Blanket. And when Carrie first approached me to talk about helping him tell this story, um, I remember having this amazing feeling of like, am I the person to do this? Am I, is this, should this be me taking on this role? Um, yeah, is this my space to take up, I guess, was what I was thinking. And I felt really, you know, it, it challenged me a lot. It challenged me um, as a journalist and as a person. Um, but it's so interesting to think over the course of the project, how much that has changed. You know, my feeling of sort of insecurity about whether I'm the right person to help tell this story. And um, I mean, I know we'll talk a bit more about this, but this feeling of it being um, a journey. So I feel like that's maybe a good example of not feeling like you belong in the beginning um, and then maybe coming to a place of belonging 
um, you know, as many years down the path. Yeah, and let's just stay on the book because I think, um, you know, that's why we're here today is to really talk about this beautiful, these beautiful pieces of work that you've co-created together. And um, maybe, Carrie, if you want to share a little bit about the witness blanket and sort of how the book came about, um, one of the things that I want to kind of open with around that is one of the pieces I've appreciated about your work so much, Carrie, is how you kind of build community around the work you do and put out in the world. And I feel like you're so intentional about building the story so that people can go along that journey with you. Yeah. Um, so the witness blanket was, I mean, we're 10 years in to the project from from the beginning, maybe longer since I first started to try to imagine a project. And it was my response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call for commemoration initiatives. Um, and in the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, survivors had put aside an amount of money to pay for commemoration. And so when, when the TRC put that call out, I started to think, what, what could I do? What could I make? And I wanted, I kind of had this idea that I wanted it to be um, a project that told the story of the experience of survivors all across this country. So I know you can you can glean out of the experience of one, the experience of many, but I really wanted it to be something that would be representative of that broader story. Um, so I quickly figured out that all of the other ways that I make things, totem carving, um, steel or stone sculpture, that no matter how much uh, meaning I attempted to uh, impart or to, to place into it, it was gonna be pretty difficult to tell the story beyond my own experience, beyond my own father's experience and, and our family's experience. Um, and it wasn't until I thought of this idea of gathering objects from um, residential school sites all across the country that I that I really felt like I was onto something, and so that was the seed of the idea was um, making something out of objects gathered from residential schools. It it, it eventually grew to include churches, governments, uh, because they were the structures, uh, the institutions that founded and operated um, residential schools, and finally I, I realized that. If we didn't add something of the beauty of Indigenous people and culture, then and the resilience and strength of Indigenous people, then the whole thing would be doing a disservice, um, and would be focusing solely on the trauma. Now, that's how I decided to include um, contemporary structures, um, contemporary cultural structures, and the idea was to to kind of show that whole continuum of. What, what residential schools were intended to target, who operated them, and maybe to show in which ways they were successful, but also to show in which ways Indigenous people were able to persevere through um, through that. Um, what the Witness Market is now is a collection of, we gathered um, over 880 objects um, and constructed them into uh, into a, a tapestry, a blanket that's 40 feet long and 10 and a half feet tall. And on each of the little pieces uh, of the blanket, there are objects gathered, these objects that, that we gathered together. Um, and while we were gathering, we were also and gathering pieces, we were also gathering stories. And so um, <clears throat> this book or these books came out of, um, uh, one of the editors from Orca was at uh, an event that I was that I was doing um, for the witness blanket out at um, out at Royal Roads University, and she said afterwards, "Have you ever thought of writing a book?" And my response was, "Well, yeah, but I think it's something that I'll do like at the end of my life, like as a reflective thing." And she said, "I really want you to think about the possibility of doing something sooner, like now." because I think that there's a lot of important stories to be told. And so that's where it began. Um, uh, she pitched the idea to, to, the, um, to the team at Orca. And when they decided they wanted to do it, I recognized right away that 
I wasn't going to have the capacity or ability to, to do it on my own. And so I said, I identified from the beginning that I would want to work with a co-author um, who, and somebody who had, you know, experience telling stories. Um, and it was actually Elaine, my wife, who said, hey, you should ask Kirsty. Um, and because we, we were friends, our kids go to the same, we're going to the same kindergarten, like, and Kirsty was thinking about um, a career change and it just really timed out well for, for, for me to ask, right? And yeah, we've spent, like, as you say, the last, we spent quite a bit of time on the first book and then a little bit less time, but still a fair amount of time on the second one. And we wanted to, to I guess, bring out more of the stories behind the objects that are on the witness blanket. Mm. Wow, um, that's, we'll share about the witness blanket um, and the documentary in our newsletter as well so that people can follow along that story and learn more about such an incredible piece of work and such an incredible piece of our history. But uh, Kirstie, I want to go back to you and sort of the reflection on the relationship and the community building that you felt being part of this story and how that may be connected to your journey of belonging. Um, yeah, I mean, it was uh, like if I think about the project from the beginning, I, I came at it very much from a journalist's frame of mind. You know, I will sit down with Carrie, I will interview him, I will, you know, find, you know, the stories that match the objects. And I, I kind of came at it in, in that way. But it actually ended up being such um, an organic process, you know, much more so it was good. It shook me from the ways that I had worked before and realized that I had to kind of take my skill sets in a different direction. But I mean, our conversations were wide reaching. Carrie and I would sit at his kitchen table and I would turn on my recorder and we would just have conversations um, and we would laugh and we would cry and sometimes they were short and sometimes they were long, um, but it was never quite what I thought it was going to be. Um, and I just think through the process and Carrie and I have had such great opportunities to speak to students. I mean, last week we spoke to, what was it Carrie, almost 5,000 students. Um, you know, we've spoken at different events to any number of communities involving, you know, elders, children, um, survivors. Um, it's just, it's just been an amazing process to be a part of. And I, I don't think I ever thought it would be that way from the beginning. You know, I thought it would be a, yeah, it just evolved and changed and grew into something else that created this big community around us. Mm. And Carrie, what about you in terms of reflection of community and the journey, not just of collecting the, the artifacts and putting them together, but then the weaving together of the story through the book as well how's that how's that showing up for you um there's a couple of things I think of um that shifted along the way like you like like you do right um it sort of started like this idea of well, if the walls could talk um so that's where this idea of the witness blanket and the pieces that witnessed this history came from um but I didn't really think deeply about what that meant from an object perspective and from the, the reality of that, right? Um, and pretty early on in the process, I had this, um, this lesson taught to me by a shoe. And it, the, the quick version of it is that Rosie, who collected it um, up in the Yukon, had a nightmare the night that she got it. She came home the next day and her husband had um, a nightmare that night. And so the next morning she showed up early at my house with the shoe in a box. And she told me how they both had the same nightmare on back-to-back -back nights. And the only thing she could think of that was causing it was the shoe. And it was, their nightmare was of like of them being afraid and running, like literally running in bed on, in their sleep. Um, and so she wanted to make sure she told me why she was bringing me the shoe. Um, realizing that I didn't like my studio at the time was in my house and I didn't want that to affect me or my family. Um, that evening I took the shoe out of the box and for the first time I really felt a powerful emotion from an object 
Um, and so I started to talk out loud. And this kind of speaks to this question of community. Like, what is community? Is it you and me and Kirsty and the people around us? Or does it include um, the trees and the grass and the air and the water? Um, and for me, the community of the witness blanket includes those pieces. And that lesson that I learned from the shoe um, was that I was going to have to respect the, the objects themselves just as much as I respected the people who gave them and the stories that they shared. And so it's, it's kind of shifted a lot of things in the way that I think about my practice as an artist. But it's interesting because it also connects really deeply to um, cultural perspective of masks having a spirit, them being our ancestors. And the way um, so we were very intentional about asking for permission from a tree before we cut it, about using every part of, of, of a salmon and the last bits and bones that don't get used are released back into the ocean. Um, so there's there's this in the language um, and in the action. Uh, and, and I know more about my Kokwaktiwak heritage than my Coast Salish heritage, but in in those ways, we think like that, right? Um, we see what many people would consider inanimate as animate. Um, and so I was, I was really intentional about, about the, the objects the same way I was with the people. And when it came down to, to figuring out how to fit all of these things together to make the blanket, I had to think about the pieces themselves um, and how to treat them with dignity and respect in the process of, of transform, tr transforming them from maybe one, one thing into another. Um, and to think about what's, What's the essence of each one? Um, and how do you honor that in at the same time as you might have to cut it apart? Ooh, I got shivers from the story about the shoe. Um, and yeah, I mean, what a powerful way to think about how every single thing in our lives is connected. And I, I have very much appreciated that in the Indigenous teachings that I've had, but I think it's a piece that we need to, as a society, start to really navigate more and more because it's become so obvious in the last few years in particular how much we're all connected and how powerful those connections are, and we need to find different ways forward. Thank you for that example, uh, those beautiful examples. So when you think about, um, and Kirsty, we'll go back to you, maybe the books and, um, you know, the, uh, and I was reflecting on kind of the title of the first book, picking up the pieces as Carrie's talking about the different pieces and how they can, and how they are connected. So tell us a little bit about sort of that journey of putting the book itself together. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was an interesting process. Um, as I mentioned, we sat down and, you know, had conversations together and Carrie had at the beginning, some very, you know, clear ideas of objects that he knew he wanted to include in the book. So both of the books kind of follow the same pattern where they focus on an object as the entry point. So whether that's a letter, um, a document, um, the shoe he mentioned, he also, one of the chapters um, focuses on his sister's braids. Um, so we sat down together and just thought about the stories that each of those objects told um, just to make sure that we were kind of covering all of the bases. And then once we chose the objects that we thought made sense for the book, then um, we went about the process of finding the survivor stories that match those objects or the story of the object itself. Um, because for every piece that Carrie received for the blanket, we know who donated it, we know where it came from, we know a little bit about that object. Um, and so then it just became kind of fitting all of these pieces together to, you know, to tell a bigger story. Um, but it was interesting, we did, there were objects at the beginning that we thought, yes, we definitely want to include that. And then it changed as it went along. I remember one 
chapter that we struggled with, and I think this is one of the last chapters we worked on, Carrie, was um, the dolls that came from your cousin. Um, and that was in the chapter where we talk about intergenerational trauma. Um, and that was a chapter that we did at the end of the process of writing the book. And then as Carrie and I were talking about that, it turned out that those were actually one of the pieces um, that he added to the blanket very late in the process because it was a challenge for him to figure out how they fit and what that story meant and how he wanted to tell that story. So it's interesting how the, the thing, you know, all the different pieces kind of came together. Um, but yeah, we really thought about, we were, yeah, intentional about the objects. Carrie had some clear ideas and then we had, we were lucky to have all this, you know, survive these videos of survivors telling the stories when Carrie was, um, because as the pieces were being collected, um, there was a documentary team traveling around um, with the people on the collection team. So we had all this video as well. So we kind of just put it all together. Harry, do you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I think that might have been and might continue to be the most challenging part of any aspect of the projects that continue to be built from the witness blanket is there's just so many um, powerful and poignant and important stories um, that it, it can be really difficult to to make like hard choices to not tell some of them. Um, and in a book, when you've got a certain number of pages and a certain amount of space, <laughs> you really have to kind of think your way through it. And so that that first writing the first book, the um, uh, picking up the pieces, the residential school memories, and making of the witness blanket, that was um, an interesting process. But we had space right um and so we started out with things that the the ones that i knew had important stories but we also wanted to tell various kinds of experiences of residential school survivors and we wanted to talk about um about different kinds of perspectives on the buildings and the and documents and so we kind of started to organize them into that those kinds of categories um and then we were from that able to go well maybe what, what don't we have here, right? And what, what are we maybe saying twice? Um, and then figuring out how to make sure that we had a good balance of stories to tell. Now, when we cut that down again, to make um, the witness blanket, truth, art and reconciliation, which is the, the newer, shorter version that's directed towards middle school age children, um, we had to go through a similar process, but at least we, we were kind of um, shrinking down from a shorter curated list, I guess, <laughs> um, and combining things sometimes in some ways so that maybe we weren't leaving out an experience, but we weren't making it the focus of the chapter and, and having it as an aspect of, uh, of another portion of it. Um, I'm going to circle back to Kirsty what you brought up around those dolls and around like how that that came together, because I think it really connects with this sense of this idea of belonging, because one of the things that residential school what residential schools took from from people was their sense of belonging, right? The um, the dolls came with a note and they were from my cousin and she's the, the, the note sort of said, I wanted you to have these because um, they're one of the few things that I have that were given to me by my mother, a residential school survivor. And they, they remind me of her cold and hard. Um, for me, that was, it was a difficult thing to process because her mom is my aunt and her aunt, and my aunt was a warm and loving and kind and generous person. And that was my experience with her, right? So I recognized that I had a different experience with this person than, um, than my cousin did. And so I had to kind of reconcile that within myself. Um, and I didn't really know how um, for quite a while. And that was the reason as Kirsty 
mentioned that it was one of the later things that I was able to complete. And um, I, I eventually read um, a book called Stranger at Home. And it was, um, it was a gift to the witness blanket. And it talks about coming home from residential school with different lengths of hair and different clothing and not really being able to speak the traditional language anymore and being called a stranger in your own home. And I sort of made the connection between the kid coming home from school and not fitting in anymore, and then coming home after school and becoming a parent and not knowing how to be a parent anymore. And so that's sort of that how, I mean, we felt, I felt it in my own family with my own dad, that there were times when we had a really difficult time um, understanding each other, getting along. Uh, and I can see that in the pain of the words um, that my cousin shared when she gave those dolls. And so what we ended up doing was putting the book in a box and with the dolls and one of the dolls has um, a button blanket um, made, my mom made a button blanket for it. And so it was this kind of acknowledgement of, of generations and of the ways in which residential schools disrupted families, um, both, as uh, like as intergenerational survivors um, like me and my cousin, but also as the kids um, that were losing parents, they were losing that that model of how to be a parent um, and and how that must have felt for them when they came home from school and their parents didn't recognize them anymore. Um, so it was uh, it was. I was asked once by a child when we did uh, uh, when we were at a book festival or a writers festival, what's your um, what's the piece that you like the least, and what's the piece that you like the most, and why? <laughs> Carrie was stumped. <laughs> and, yeah, and why? And and it was this this little voice from the back, and it was like totally sounded like a reporter, like maybe Kirsty put him up to it. And I and I sort of turned to her and I was like, maybe, maybe you could take this one, Kirsty. And she was like, oh no, this is not mine. And I thought about it for a second and then like that story came to me. And so I said, it's both by one of the least favorite pieces. And here's why. And it's become one of my favorite pieces because I was finally able to figure out. So figure out how it fit in to the to the narrative of the blanket. Ooh, that is an incredible story. Thank you so much for sharing that and gifting us that. Can, Carrie, I think that's a piece that uh, we, as people think about the book and um, have the opportunity to engage with the witness blanket in different ways um, to reflect on the many levels of understanding of the truths of what residential schools did to Indigenous peoples. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, there's so many layers to it. It's, it's very difficult to unpack. So for you to digest that and share that back to us in that way. Thank you. Um, let's stay on that concept around truth and reconciliation, because obviously the witness blanket came out of the incredible work um, of sharing those stories and us understanding these histories in Canada. And as these books are now the, another tool for people to start to understand what those truths are in Canada and how we can move towards reconciliation. So what would you like people to reflect on as they pick up these books and read them? I guess it depends on who the person is um, and what they understand coming in. Um, if you're opening the book to to learn about something that you don't know very much about, um, one of the things that I think is maybe the most powerful aspect of the blanket is that the objects and the stories are relatable regardless of your history and experience. And the relatability doesn't necessarily mean, have to mean shared experience because, but it can be that one person's experience of school was, was 
fond, beautiful uh, memories. And and if you compare that to some of the things that you read about what happened in residential schools, that might um, make it more clear to you how terrible they were. Um, if if you have um, if you look at the braids, my sister's braids on the blanket, and it, it can be a really jarring thing to see uh, a braid of hair, let alone two, and Lots of people have different memories about hair and some of them are traumatic and some of them are not. But when you listen to this, when you read about their story and what they went through to, to cut their hair in as safe and well planned a way as possible um, and how emotional that still was, then, um, and anybody who's been, has had a bad haircut maybe um, and felt crummy about it for a while, think about what it's like when you don't have a choice and it's your very identity that's being altered on purpose um if if it's an intergenerational survivor like me um maybe what i want people to reflect on is or i hope that they reflect on because i i don't like to be prescriptive about things is because what it did for me is it showed me so much that i didn't fully understand about my father and therefore didn't understand about myself, right? Um, the more you understand what has made a person the way they are, um, the easier it is for you to, to accept, accept them as they are, um, accept all of them because all, all of us have uh, flaws and things that annoy each other. Um, and, and some people have triggers and um, and trauma that surfaced. And so for me, going to counseling with my dad when I was about 12 years old, because my mom had finally had enough of our arguing and um, our inability to get along and learning then that our relationship kind of took a turn for the worse when he, I turned the age that he was when he went to residential school, and recognizing that his only parental model was a residential school supervisor helped me even at that age understand that this wasn't just my dad being a jerk and it wasn't just me being a bad kid this was something bigger than both of us um and so you can forgive a lot more right and you, that means you can forgive not just the the per, like for me for my my dad but also myself i can forgive myself more um, and so that's the kind of thing that I hope, um, that I hope people reflect upon. Wow. Um, yeah, such a, so many powerful pieces in there and thinking about that relationship with your father and how we can, how we need to each learn about each other to figure out different ways and different perspectives that we need to take to be in relationship. Kirsty, how about you? Um, I was just thinking about, um, again, it's always for me when I first think about, you know, starting to work with Carrie on this project, I always remember feeling like I wanted, um, you know, like a checklist or some kind of guide on, you know, how do I practice reconciliation? How do I be a good ally? Like, I want somebody to tell me what that is. Um, and I've heard many people ask that many times and different events that Carrie and I have been at, people have said, you know, like, I, I want to practice reconciliation, I want to be an ally, how do I do that? Um, and it's so interesting to me, the like the thing that stands out for me the most about working on these books with Carrie is he talks, we have a chapter, it's actually in both books, because I think we just thought it was really important. Um, and it talks about reconciliation being a journey. And Carrie has said that many times. Um, and I kind of, for me, that was sort of my aha moment in this process was realizing I didn't need a checklist. Um, I didn't need someone to tell me what reconciliation looked like, um, but it could be something that I, that was within me and, and me being a part of this journey was my own small act, my own small way of 
of you know taking part in this process and that that for me is is what has stood out the most it's just it's a journey it's a journey and it's a different journey for every person no matter your background and like Carrie said you know how the different ways that people will read the book depending on where they come from it's it doesn't matter if you're picking up the book in some way you're participating in reconciliation you're on your own journey and I think for me that's just the most profound thing that's come out of this Mm, that's a beautiful sentiment to kind of move us towards wrapping up with in terms of both reconciliation being a journey, but I also heard from you that that the relationship that you two are building together through this also um, would be moving towards reconciliation. And I feel like, um, you know, Carrie, one of the things I reflect on as I look at the various pieces of work you've done, and I think about the Totem Project at Oakland's in particular, like you've just done such a beautiful job of sharing ways of showing up for each other that to me is the basis of how we need to move in reconciliation and building relationship and understanding together, whether that's obviously my interpretation, but uh, it's just one of the things I really appreciate about your work. I I call it making sure that the process uh, matches the goal. Um, And it is, I mean, whether it's me and Kirsty working together to, to write a book whether it's me working with a team to gather objects from across the country to make a witness blanket, or whether it's coming in once or twice a week over the course of a couple of years to carve a pole with um, with a, a group of kids from kindergarten to grade five, uh, that, that, that building of relationship and building of community, um, I think that it's the most one of the most critical aspects of reconciliation. Um, When we start to understand each other's ways, um, then we can start to include them in the way we make decisions and the actions we take. So reconciliation also includes um, the the phrase land back, right? Um, But I don't think of that as give me your property or give us your property. I think about it in terms of how do we collectively think about land? Because if we only ever think about it like property, and maybe this goes to those objects and the the agency and the spirit that's within them. But if we only ever think of land as object and resource, um, then we're not thinking about it in, in, an, in a sustainable manner. We're only taking or taking for profit, not for need. Um, and it goes against that idea of using all aspect, all parts of the salmon. Um, it goes against the idea of looking through the forest to figure out which tree you can build a house from um, and leaving the other ones. And so there's this Kuala word, Awitnakula, which means to live in good relationship with the land, air, water, spirit worlds, and everything in them. And I. I, I've been thinking a lot about that in the process of making my work um, because I think that we have to start to apply that kind of thinking to technology, to economy, to a lot of different aspects of how we, um, uh, uh, maybe a lot of different as- aspects of society. Uh, because when we're talking about reconciliation, it doesn't, it's not just residential schools. Right. Um, It's not just mending the families and making some reparation for some bad decisions that that were made in the past. It's recognizing the way that that different colonial structures continue today and the way that they continue to divide based on race, based on uh, gender and and to to break them down and and rebuild them so that we can have more belonging. it's 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 an interesting thing because it, it always feels like when we have these kind of conversations, the people who benefit from the most are the ones who get their backs up and they get there that it feels like maybe someone's gonna take something from them. Um sorry, my coffee machine's going off right now. <laughs> um it might feel 
but really what's happening, I think, um, I'm just gonna wait out my machine. It stopped, okay. I think really what's happening in, in that process of, of creating belonging, of creating more equity, isn't anybody giving anything up. It's because that's, belonging is not a finite resource, right? There's enough of it for all of us if we make space for everybody to feel it. Um, but maybe because we have this kind of capitalist mindset where it's like, what's mine is mine. Then if, then if I have it, maybe other people having it might mean I have less of it. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't think that's true. I, in fact, the more people who feel like they belong, the more belonging you can feel too, because you're broadening your community. Um, and working with the kids at Opens, um, and we just went this last week to put the hummingbird on top uh, of the pool. It, it, it's, I like, I was asked after we put it up, do you think this is the most important work you've done? And I didn't want to say, yes, this is the most important work I've done because I also made the witness blanket and it, I really felt that way when I finished making that one. But I think working with the kids on the Oakland's totem and seeing the responses um, and seeing how they, uh, the things they think about, we, we made a documentary. And so we have sort of these, these responses from the students at the end. Um, I think it has the potential to be the most important work I've done because that's where the future of our society lives right with them and if they come in with a little bit less of the burden of capitalist expectations or a bit more of an understanding of indigenous worldviews and the true history of how Canada was formed and continues to function um, then then maybe we can get closer to this thing we talk about called reconciliation um, yeah, wow. There was like a dozen pieces in there. I would love to spend another few hours on, but uh, um, I, you know, I just really appreciate in particular the comment around the belonging and how, you know, there is enough space for all of us in this world and that we need to really lean into that. And that's ultimately why we started the Bridges of Belonging series, because it's like, how can we learn more about each other to be in relationship in different ways, to take care of each other, to create the space for us each to show up in the ways we want to need to be able to move forward in a different way, a way that is about each of us and what our needs are rather than this extraction and pushing people out. It's like, how do we bring people in? Yeah, any last words, Kirsty? Um, no, this has been, I mean, just this has been a great chat. It's always amazing. Um, Carrie and I talk about the book a lot and how, uh, you know, every conversation kind of brings up um, different aspects and just it's good to sit and think about um, how it fits into the bigger picture. And I think for me, that's something, I mean, four or five years in, every time we talk about it, it's, you know, there's something new. Um and there's something else to think about. And I think that's, you know, you can't ask for more than that. Yeah, what an incredible gift to be part of a project together in that relationship together and to keep growing and exploring it as you go forward. How about you, Carrie, last words? I don't know, Christy summed it up pretty well. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it is true, the things the, like, the different places that the witness blanket has brought me um, continue to um, astound and inspire me. The, the very fact that these books exist were um, because of, uh, partly because of, of my a partnership with Kirsty working on them, but also because another person who had the power to make this happen um, made that their action after seeing the witness blanket and that's the same reason we have a documentary it's the same reason that the blanket went on tour for four and a half years it's the same reason that it's now 
in the long-term care of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, and we're working on multiple digital projects to continue the storytelling around the witness blanket. In fact, I'm even working on a VR project with Kirk, Kirsty's husband, um, and together he and I are working on a, on a soundscape for inside the VR um, experience. And so it, it continues to grow, and um, sometimes I find myself talking about belonging. Other times I find myself speaking at a, a world intellectual property forum and talking about the agreement that we that we made to put the blanket into the Museum for Human Rights. Um, and other times I'm talking to a curator from a museum in Berlin about objects and their meaning and how the things that I've learned from the process of making the witness blanket might influence the way that they care for the cultural objects that they have in their museum. So I never know where I'm going to go, but this project really has taken me to a lot of different places and a lot of really, really interesting conversations. Yeah, absolutely. And the journey will only continue, it sounds like. So we will in, we encourage our audience as you take this in to uh, pick up the Picking Up the Pieces book and the Witness Blanket book and to watch the documentary about the Witness Blanket and just engage in what your journeys are of reconciliation and of belonging because we have this beautiful opportunity to be in community together and to build different types of relationships as we go forward. So thank you so much, Carrie and Kirsty, for your time today and for your just in, um, investment in this important work and sharing the story of the work together, the work of um, creating and bringing these stories forward to the world. So grateful for both of you. Thanks, Thanks for, having, for having us. us.